So we're in the Valley of the Kings, which is also known as the Valley of the Gates of the Kings. Um, and it's literally a valley in Egypt where they would cut, uh, make, well, they would cut tombs into the rock um, between the 16th and 11th century BC. So it's during the New Kingdom. And that's the same as yesterday where we saw Karnak. Most of Karnak was built during the New Kingdom. So it's the 18th, 19th and 20th dynasties. Um, and Seti the first over here is one we're going to start with, which is kind of the main, well, it's one of the best ones, one of the most extensive, one of the most beautifully decorated, and one of the best renovated as well. Um, you actually have to pay extra to get into this one. It's about, I don't know, 20 quid extra, something like that. Um, but we want to get in here before the tourists kind of kick off and it starts getting really busy. So we're here at just, sort of, just gone seven in the morning. So I think it opens at six, so we're not too, um, too late. So I just want to set the scene for you a little bit. So you remember yesterday when we spoke about Akhenaten and how he created that monotheistic religion. And in doing so, a lot of the wealth in Egypt had been used building Amarna and it had created a lot of sort of social upheaval. Well, Tutankhamun, as you remember, kind of did his level best to return things to the status quo. But Seti I also inherited um, that bad situation. The work wasn't done yet. And so a lot of Seti's reign focused on um, religious reform, but also recapturing lands that had been taken during the times of Akhenaten, when Akhenaten had kind of neglected relationships with other kingdoms. In particular, um, he focused on re-establishing Egypt's sovereignty over Canaan and Syria. And these were areas that were under control of the Hittites. And so he was involved with a number of battles with the Hittites. And whilst he didn't crush the Hittites and you know, completely get rid of them, he did win back some very significant areas of Egypt, which hadn't been under Egyptian control since Akhenaten. And so generally we consider Seti to be quite a successful Pharaoh. And so in today's uh, exploration of his tomb, uh, we're expecting to see references to perhaps um, war gods. Uh, we're expecting to see perhaps references to specific battles that he won against the Hittites. These are the kind of things that we're going to be looking out for. Whether or not I'll be able to actually spot them and recognize what we're looking at is another thing. But I can assure you those kind of things will be in here. So just one final bit, a little tidbit of information for you. So Seti is named after Set, um, and that's the god of the desert, storms, disorder, violence, and foreigners um, in ancient Egypt. I think that's quite interesting, considering that um, he's sort of well known for his battle success, his military prowess, if you will, um, that he's named after the god of violence. He sort of resembles an aardvark or an African wild dog or a donkey. So he's a bit of a sort of a ambiguous creature. <laughs> This is one of the very deep tombs as well. On the GoPro it's flashing, but in reality it's not. <laughs> but look, look at this now. You see the way it goes so deep into the um, tomb. The idea is that you're actually descending into the world of the afterlife. It's almost a journey we are taking by going down into the tomb, deep down. And this is the crocodile. Uh, is there's, a, there's a crocodile uh, god. That again is the crocodile do uh, mm -hmm. god. Which is interesting. We didn't, we didn't see any of the crocodile god yesterday uh, when we were at, uh, well, we didn't spot it at least when we were at Karnak. Thoth, this is the, the god of hieroglyphs and writing. Now, this, this is a really, really cool feature. This is actually a dam. Uh, a well, sorry, not a dam. Uh, they, they're not sure exactly what they were for, but they, they come in some of the later um, tombs, and they think they might have actually stopped water coming down into the tomb, so it actually had a functional purpose. I'm trying to be respectful, because it is technically a tomb. But some people down here are being extremely loud. So 
say this is actually really, really cool. I like this a lot. So this is Anubis, and he's the god of funerary rites, a protector of graves, and guide to the underworld. And this is awesome because you can see he's holding the pharaoh on the shoulder here, and obviously this being his tomb, presumably Anubis is going to guide him uh, into the, uh, guide him through the process of, you know, death. Um, that's my assumption, at least. But really cool. I think for me, Anubis like just has a certain mystique uh, about him. I just think the way he's portrayed in his face as well. Uh, there's something just very captivating about him. One thing to mention, I'll go into some more detail later, is that most of the tombs were raided uh, and the artifacts and wealth was stolen from them. It was only really Tutankhamun uh, who still had um, you know, all the various things in his uh, tomb that he was buried with. So now we're going down further, another level. I don't know about you, but I love the uh, mm, stars and the teeth. Museum, the alabaster, the Seti, the first coffin in the British Museum. Maybe we'll leave that bit out. Don't want to get old Blighty in a bad name. This is Hathor, which is one of the first gods. And she's a kind, motherly god. Wow. Yeah. Very cool. Well, ladies and gents, that certainly didn't disappoint, did it? Interesting to not see uh, battle scenes, but perhaps I'm sure they're mentioned in the hieroglyphics. Um, well, I'm puffed though. Whew, but you're probably thinking, why don't those bloody ladies show a bit of respect, eh? Keep their voices down, not yell in the tomb. Well, don't worry, ladies and gents, because viewers, there is something called the Pharaoh's Curse. <laughs> And it's said that the Pharaoh's curse caused illness, um, it caused bad luck and even death. And um, Lord Carnarvon, who actually financed the um, 
excavation of Tutankhamun, he actually died. Um, and very shortly afterwards, um, he got a mosquito bite and when he was shaving, he cut that uh, mosquito bite and it became infected, which led to blood poisoning and the development of pneumonia. Um, and so a lot of people sort of, you know, attribute this to the Pharaoh's curse. But um, jokes aside, obviously we don't wish the death on anyone. We don't wish death on anyone. But you know, maybe those, those ladies will miss their bus home today and that'll be the Pharaoh's curse. Get a bit of bad luck. <laughs> I'm going to go and have a look at uh, Ramses III and he is um, considered to be essentially the last great monarch uh, of the New Kingdom. He basically reigned um, during a time that saw um, a decrease in the economic and political power of Egypt, um, made worse by a number of sort of uh, invasions. Um, and he did, he was known as the um, warrior pharaoh, so he was quite um, successful and one of the things he did was he defended against the sea people but in doing so um, he, he did substantially weaken the Egyptian military but nonetheless he did sort of slow that decline but ultimately um, you know it was sort of coming towards the end of that real uh, era of sort of success and power uh, and so he's an interesting one and funny enough um, he was actually murdered um, in the end he was uh, assassinated um, and that was in association but with his uh, his queen was the one who sort of caused it so yeah interesting fella in, in fact funny enough he beat the sea people twice once was in Lebanon on land but the second time was actually at sea and the Egyptians weren't known for particular prowess at sea warfare so what he did was he lured them into the Nile Delta and then he literally ambushed them with archers on the banks of the Nile and actually used sea hooks to hook at the ships uh, and drag them in towards the uh, the banks where then uh, you know his soldiers could jump on the ships essentially and engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat um, and that's how he defeated the sea people at sea he turned uh, a disadvantage into an advantage look at this now look how busy it's gotten they're all just underneath the little shade that is around here so we're just going to try and find this tomb then <laughs> You can see what happens when you don't pay the extra fee for the quieter ones. The peaceful idea of visiting a tomb is officially over. It's not exactly giving you the sense of atmosphere that a tomb should. But you know, I think there's enough of that pharaoh's curse to go around for everyone. <laughs> Two so yeah, Grant top tip, go and pay the extra money and see Seti the first. It's a ten times better experience than this. You didn't even get to go you don't even get to go all the way into the tomb, so you don't even see him uh, where the coffin would have gone, the sarcophagus. This is definitely Instagram versus reality. <laughs> Poor old Ramses the third. Now we Poor old Ramses the third. All those people bumping into each other, shouting in there. Bloody hell! I was going to do uh, Ramses the fourth after this, son of Ramses the third, uh, who's an interesting uh, pharaoh because obviously he inherited the throne from his father Ramses the third, um, who had just been assassinated. Um, I was going to do a whole bit about it, but bloody hell, not that it's worth it. We'll get in there. And I'll be like, oh, and here's this and that. And you lot, all you'll be seeing is back of, back of a load of bloody tourist heads. So we've come up with a better strategy, which is forget about the uh, specific history of the individual pharaohs. Just go to the furthest away tomb <laughs> and figure out who it is when we get there. Yeah. <laughs> 
Oh, this is Upper Egypt. And this is Lower South, Egypt. South and North. Yes. Yeah, south and North. And North. This is flag. Flag. Yeah. Ah, that and makes this sense. This on top. Matt just as good. Yeah, and so this is the papyrus because of the Nile Delta, yeah? Yes. yes yeah, and then this is the lotus because it grows here in the water? Yes. Right. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Before the work in here and come the message, stop work, the king he died. And the stop. Oh, mm. the king died, so they stopped. The stop, stop, stop. Mm. Ah. So this is complete? Yes, complete. complete. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now the ceiling complete. The stuff have a uh, wall and the stuff have the ceiling. Yeah. And the stuff is all not completed. Yeah. Just a sketch. Just the sketches, yeah. Because they didn't, didn't finish because the king died. Oh, interesting. I thought they would have just continued. <laughs> this is much better, there's no one here. Yeah. Oh, wow. Oh, there's the actual tomb here. Yeah. So th this is the this is the god of the afterlife. The Zeus, god of the afterlife, and yeah. god of the dead, and in, par in final judgment, judge. Yeah. The Zeus. And the and the paradise. Oh, this is, I've not seen one with the sarcophagus. This is the first one. Wow. Down in the city. Down in the sea, baby, no clothes. <laughs> <laughs> no clothes. <laughs> You're joking. <laughs> really? Oh, just let me jump around. Telephone. Telephone. This is awesome. Oh no, it's okay. Amy, have a look. So I'm currently lying on the floor next to it. <laughs> look at that. <laughs> this is amazing. Not big. Oh, you can see it here. There's a mirror. I didn't, you don't need to lie yeah. down. Oh, yeah. Hey, do you want to put The king has no hat. Down, 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 down. Good one. <laughs> Down further. Oh, no. Oh, well, that is quite something. Well, that was unexpected. <laughs> I don't know how I feel about that. I'm always a bit conflicted about those sort of things. In, the, in one way, it's just a bit of harmless fun, but I hope we weren't, we weren't desecrating a tomb. <laughs> We obviously, anything. we didn't touch anything. We didn't touch the tomb, so we were still respectful. Oh. And also, um, we obviously have a great respect for, you know, tombs and stuff like that uh, in general. So I think that was borderline, wasn't it? <laughs> Whenever we do these B-roll scenes of me just like wandering around the complex, I swear every time I like forget how to walk. I was like, how do I walk? Is, um, is this a normal walk? <laughs> <laughs> so that's the top tip so far of our experience here touring the Valley of the Kings. Top tip one, get here really early. Top tip two, pay the extra money and see Seti the first uh, or any of the other uh, you know, tombs that are um, a bit extra. It means they're a lot quieter. And also Seti the First is widely regarded as one of the most impressive, um, you know, visually. So that's top tip two. Top tip three, 
apart from Seti the first, which you pay for separately, they give you entrance to three uh, three tombs. So with your three, highly recommend suggesting picking some quiet ones, out of the way ones. Um, and then top tip four is, and I'm gonna go see Tutankhamun in a moment, we're gonna go back to the ticket office and get a ticket for it. But don't just focus on Tutankhamun. And I'm gonna explain in a minute why I recommend that. But for now, we're gonna have a look at a smaller tomb. Um, as mentioned, I want you to see a more modest tomb to give you a general impression for the whole kind of area and the mixture and the types of tombs that you'll see. So we're going to Thutmus tomb now. Oh, I thought he was Thutmus. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he liked that one. I know we all do this here. You're not Thutmus? No. Oh, okay. My son. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Masalam. Where are you from? Australia. Thank you, sir. It's a bit near this one, isn't it? Yeah, another well on the right. Okay, when I said some of them are more modest, I may not have picked the best example of that. This is deep. Mm. We're really, we're really down in the earth here. Oh. Come the apocalypse, this place would be alright, wouldn't it? This is substantial. It's so funny because I was actually going to bring a head torch, but I forgot. Can't explode. Can't fall. Can't fall down into a well. These are actually just storage rooms. Bloody hell! There's an open coffin in here. And you can see all the crap around there. Bloody horror! That was terrifying. <laughs> oh God! <laughs> I jumped. I don't know. I just, I just, I just <laughs> freaked out for a second. These are actually just storage rooms, I believe, from what I remember from the research. They're just a little bit too dark for comfort. <laughs> but you can see their, you can see their rough cut, rough cut stones. Oh, it's just a bit creepy. Oh, it's just, it's just a little bit too creepy for me. <laughs> Yeah, look at this. It's beautiful, isn't it? quality content. I'm half expecting to like disappear through a soft spot on the floor and uh, you know go into a whole new chamber they've not discovered. I've watched too many mummy films. But you can see again it's just rough cuts so. then. To be honest they're not that interesting. <laughs> it's not slightly less scary because there's a little bit of light in here. I can't believe they put a bloody wooden box in there, the size of a bloody coffin. Did you see it? Should I show them? I'm going to go. I'm going to. I'm going to brave it one more time. Bloody hell! It's dark in here. <laughs> it's bloody terrifying. <laughs> I shouldn't be swearing. It's a holy place. I guess. Look at this. Yeah, there's handprints on it. Oh, don't say that whilst I'm in here. I said it last time. 
<laughs> Don't scare the hell out of me, woman. God almighty, did you enjoy that? <laughs> And again, these star motifs. I really like it. I think we have to put this somewhere where we live, Amy. I really like the design. It's interesting that this is everywhere, isn't it? Mm, it is. They just seem. I can tell that they're very vibrant. They are vibrant, and also. They're not chipped in the same way the other ones are. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Maybe they just wanted to give an impression of what it would have been like. I think so. Okay, okay. Jordan Trail all over again. That's hot. <laughs> yeah, that's the other thing that's unusual about these tubes is they are cooler. It's definitely cooler down here. Yeah. But this, this one's the coolest because it's so deep. But some of the other ones are still pretty warm. Like Seti's was, Seti the first, was still pretty hot in there. Um, and that's the other thing about this content today, is like, I'm absolutely dying. I'm trying to give you good historical information, walking around, you know, approaching 30, approaching 40 degrees, so. Yeah, it gets up to 42. Yeah, it gets up to 42 degrees today, so. Just really struggling to, uh, you know, do a good job in the blistering heat. Any mad, mad dogs and Englishmen go out in the midday sun. Beautiful views outside of that uh, tomb there of Thutmus. Another thing to note is that um, there are some issues in, with the rock. Um, there's a number of different types of rock here that the Egyptians excavated into, some of which are not as, um, uh, well, don't provide as much structural support as others. Uh, and so at times, even the Egyptians, when they would come across a gravel layer, um, would abandon um, the tombs. And so there are, within this area, some um, abandoned uh, tombs, abandoned construction projects. Um, and interestingly enough, the quality of the rock um, varies enough that even for today, maintaining these tombs and ensuring that they don't collapse causes issues um, because of the different quality of rock that you can find just within one tomb. And having now been down Thutmus, um, this just occurred to me that I'd read this because you can see that you know, tombs like this, how deep they are, that, you know, of course, you know, they go through various different layers um, of rock. So, yeah, interesting to see that. Uh, and you start to get a feel for how difficult it is to maintain these things. Anyway, blah, blah. Um, next, we're gonna go look at Tutankhamun. So we're just walking back down. And you can see over here, this sort of shale that's fallen down from the top of the mountain. I believe it was that, or that kind of thing, that um, hid Tutankhamun, Tutankhamun's tomb. And um, Tutankhamun uh, was one of the few tombs that still had a lot of its contents within it. It wasn't raided uh, by, you know, the uh, tomb robbers. Um, interestingly enough, uh, tomb robbing was always an issue. That was one of the reasons they stopped building grand pyramids, is because they were a little bit more out of the way, a little bit more hidden, didn't attract so much attention. But anyway, tomb raiding has always been uh, an issue. Even at the state level, the priests themselves quite shamelessly um, hired people to raid the tombs of, uh, you know, bygone ph pharaohs, very old, ancient pharaohs, uh, which was awful. And they used that money. Um, to make themselves wealthier, or rather money, those you know, artifacts or whatever, to make themselves uh, wealthier. And it's, you have to think that these are meant to be the people who uphold you know, the relig religious values, the religious beliefs. Um, and so for them to go and desiccate, and, uh, desecrate um, tombs like this and show such disrespect is shocking. Um, but that happened. And so most of these tombs around here uh, were essentially completely stripped 
over the ages. Let's remember that some of these tombs are three and a half thousand years old. And one of the tombs has graffiti on it from uh, Romans. They were writing uh, on the walls, you know, Maximus was here, that type of thing. So it wasn't like people didn't know about this place. You know, Victorians and all these sorts of people would come and visit, here, visit this place. So it was well known. Um, and hence, I guess why it's unsurprising that over time, you know, it's just been essentially completely stripped um, of its all its value. But Tutankhamun, he was not the most significant pharaoh. Remember, he inherited the throne when he was nine, and he died when he was 19. So he only held the, the throne for about, or was only, you know, charged for about 10 years. Um, and during that time, you know, he wasn't the most significant pharaoh. The reason he's become so famous is purely because his tomb was hidden sufficiently for Howard Carter to discover it in the 20s. Um, and of course, it still had the great, um, you know, golden mask. Uh, that we see when we think of Egypt and we see in all the imagery. Um, but that mask, they believe now, may have actually been soldered together with two pieces of gold and they used uh, some old, some, someone else's uh, gold mask to make it. And that was because Tutankhamun's father, Akhenaten, had essentially stripped uh, a lot of the wealth from Egypt during his construction of uh, Amarna, which we've discussed. So. He wasn't the wealthiest king either. And some suggest that the reason that his tomb was so full of items was because the priests tried to just stuff anything that was related to Tutankhamun in Tutankhamun's tomb. You can see that it's kind of haphazard the way everything is sort of chucked in there. Because you remember, Tutankhamun died without an heir. So the priests thought, hey, this is great. Wipe them out of the, the historical record, get rid of all memory of them and start over from scratch. Um, but from our perspective, that just meant that we found a tomb that was like full of these artifacts. And of course that made Tutankhamun in modern history immensely famous. But in reality, he wasn't the most significant pharaoh and he probably also wasn't the most wealthy. Certainly, I guess in a way in modern history, he has become super significant since 1920s. You know, every, a lot of people's interest in Egyptology stems from that fantastic discovery from, by Howard Carter in the 20s. And so I think that's the reason I want to go look at Tutankhamun, because when I was a kid, that's what you learned about. You learned about Howard Carter and you learned about Tutankhamun. And that kind of birthed that interest in history in me to some extent, along with other periods of history. You look quite a picture. <laughs> Amy had to get a skirt yesterday because she was getting a lot of looks when we were walking around the main town of Luxor. Too much attention. So he died at 19, which was very young, so this tomb was very hastily constructed. And there's not a lot of wall paintings in here. The ones that do remain are very well preserved. I'm standing next to Tutankhamun, but I'm not sure if I'm able to show this on YouTube. He is slight of stature, and he had a number of health issues, um, minor and major. He had psoriasis, a curved spine, um, and there is some suggestion that he walked with a cane but his sandals were also found in his tomb and they didn't show signs of wear on one particular side, so they don't think he limped. famous tomb of all, ironically. <laughs> oh, can't see anything now. Bloody hell. Yeah, I put my sandals on. Oh, it's come out of the dark into the bright. 
I think there are 62 or something tombs here. So they have dozens and dozens of stories um, to tell these historical sites. So it is difficult to give you a kind of a full picture of the history without sending it into a bloody four hour video. Nonetheless, I think we can give you some core history here. Um, but yeah, awesome video to make. And uh, yeah, thank you very much for watching. And tomorrow we're in for a very special treat. Um, so but I won't uh, spoil the surprise. That'll be next week's video. But um, yeah, thanks again for watching. And uh, yeah, join us on the next adventure, next video as we continue the adventure here in Egypt. Like and subscribe. <laughs>